y'all hey so time to get started for tonight's live um it's a lot going on today but just a couple minutes late we're gonna get started right now i have a lot to share with y'all i got the computer in the background so i'm gonna actually go to my personal postpartum planning guide that i made um i don't know sometime last year hey thanks for joining oh let me pin something in the chat too so people can see um i guess this is postpartum preparing what to expect all of the above basically any questions i can answer about postpartum would be great because i feel like this is not a one size fits all type of top conversation like it's not about to be so but i could at least go over the basics in planning and preparing for your postpartum what to expect like during our pregnancy, I feel like we spend a lot of time planning gender reveals, planning baby showers, um, planning babies' names, buying clothes, car seats. It's just so much that goes on. Uh, doctor's appointments. It's literally like moms are in nonstop motion, and I know they're most likely still working. Um, so they're in literally nonstop motion, and nobody ever sits down and takes the time to plan their postpartum so we're about to do that tonight and of course i'm gonna save this video so to get us started i'm gonna go over what to expect postpartum because honestly i feel the same about postpartum and labor when you kind of have an idea of what to expect it just makes things go a little that much more smoothly even though i also want to mention to keep in mind having some flexibility in this too because usually nothing ever goes as planned have you ever planned a birthday party and it went exactly as planned like i'm i'm gonna go ahead and say that's 100 percent though because that just don't be happening so with postpartum just like with labor and just like with being a new mom you can only plan so much but still knowing what to expect okay you gonna pop up okay still knowing what to expect beforehand actually you know it just takes some of the damn what's the word i'm looking for i guess the unknown factor away it takes a little bit of the unknown factor away hey kayla thanks for joining girl okay so we're just getting started i'm gonna start with what to expect postpartum and obviously this would be perfect for you so um i have my little notes here so what to expect first i want to start with breastfeeding because most of us we we're pregnant and we want to breastfeed right but then nobody ever gives you like the real on breastfeeding so i feel like we're never fully prepared for breastfeeding because now back to what i said about making plans and being flexible in those plans like you still have to leave some wiggle room for things that might pop up like there's little things that could pop up there's sore nipples there's um little infections that like to pop up sometimes tongue ties um baby maybe not being able to latch as, as properly as they should so that's causing more pain for the mom little things could pop up so one of the things that i would say for as far as planning for your postpartum is to have somebody on standby just in case you do need them and when i say somebody i mean a lactation consultant it's just good to know at least one, maybe someone that uh, offers virtual consultations that you can kind of talk to about like, is this normal? Is this not normal? Um, things like that. So breastfeeding is a big role when it comes to postpartum. Like if you've seen one of the posts that I made recently, I don't know how long ago it was, but I actually got on the calculator and calculated how often moms are, actually have to sit down and breastfeed when they choose to breastfeed exclusively right so newborn babies they're going to eat anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 and i want to say on the heavier end 40 minutes so especially when they're newborns the colostrum is very thick breastfeeding is a whole nother conversation but um the colostrum is very thick so it takes some time for baby to get that amount that they need um into their bellies so breastfeeding can take anywhere from 15 to 40 minutes now if you take the average okay 30 minutes uh per sitting now we also have to take an account that newborns are breastfeeding around the clock every two hours so that was that basically led me to the calculator 
you're sitting down for at least six hours a day just breastfeeding now i made a couple posts about not planning anything but that's that's not what we're talking about now but it just comes back to that six hours a day that you're about to be breastfeeding like it doesn't really make sense to have this big plan and you're gonna take the baby on play dates and uh people coming to visit you're gonna make meals every day for your family like that part doesn't necessarily make sense hey girl hey birth in a box <clears throat> ashley hey girl but that part doesn't really make sense if you take into account how many hours you're actually going to be sitting down just to breastfeed so six hours a day you're sleeping about eight hours a day hopefully more if you're a new mom because that's the other thing that we're going to get into like um lack of sleep it's very very important and i know they say this all the time like oh sleep when the baby sleep it's very very important that you get those naps in during the day for me i'm a little bit more of a laid-back mom don't don't just take advice from me but i'm gonna be honest i'm a little bit more of a laid-back mom if i know that my babies are in a safe place like okay let's say my bed is up against the wall we're on the bed. I got a newborn baby. They're not about to crawl out of the bed. They can't roll yet. You're fed. You're happy. You're just kind of chilling. I'm going to doze off for a little bit. Like nothing's going to happen to the baby. Nothing's going to happen to the baby. I did this with both of my children. And I don't even know for how long. Like even now, like people be like, oh, how can you take naps? Girl, they're aware. Like they're old enough now where I can have those conversations. Like don't, don't open the door. Don't touch the stove. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, the, like what's going to happen? They're in a safe environment. I'm about to take a nap. And usually as moms, we're light sleepers anyway. So if something was to happen, you're going to pop right up like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> so there's that. Don't let that stop you from not taking naps, basically. Like those are going to be crucial because you're going to be getting up in the middle of the night. You think you're going to sleep throughout the night. Like, oh, I'm going to just wait till tonight to sleep. No, you're going to be waking up every two hours. And especially in those beginning, like this is more so geared towards the first month of postpartum, uh, especially in that first month of postpartum. It's going to be um, more so you actually sitting up to breastfeed. Now, once baby gets older, there's kind of like I forgot. It's like a name for it. I forgot what it is. But um, you have the ability to actually lay down, breastfeed your baby and sometimes just be sleep like the baby will find a boob and be so accustomed to what they're sorry what they're doing it's gonna be easy peasy for them to just uh find your boob even while you sleep so but for the beginning phase that first month first couple months yes yeah, side land but it's something else they called it like uh sleep feeding night feeding something i forgot i don't know it's like a little trendy name it's nothing major but um yeah, basically that's what that is that you're going to be looking forward to when your baby gets older. But we have to build that perfect routine uh, in the beginning. So that's one thing I want to mention. Take that into consideration. You're going to be breastfeeding for a long time. Hey, thanks for joining. Let me know if y'all have any questions at all that y'all want to drop or chime in at all about postpartum, your own personal experiences. Because as I started this video, everything is individual oh dream feeding i think I, that is what it is yes where you be sleep but you still breastfeeding <laughs> yes <laughs> and those are great times too i love that <laughs> but every postpartum period is going to be individual like it's not a one size fits all when we're talking about postpartum planning so um okay so breastfeeding um why did i write down changes in your milk i'll be writing down these little bullet points but what did i mean by that I guess I just kind of meant like uh, the engorgement, the colostrum that goes, it goes from colostrum, okay, the, the thick milk that kind of takes a while for them to get out, uh, might be longer feedings. Then you go to the transition milk and you might feel engorged during this time, especially if you're pumping, like you're going to be overproducing during that time until it kind of regulates to what you need for your baby. Um, and then you have your mature milk, which is after that. And by that time, you're probably in a phase where it's like me and baby got this down pat. Um, the feedings might get shorter, but they also might get more frequent depending on the baby. So that's the other thing. Then the other thing I wanted to mention is mood swinging. Uh, there's a couple of different feelings that you're going to feel postpartum. Like 
a lot of them are anxiety i feel like especially for new moms like um well for all moms i'll say for sure we be checking to see if our baby's breathing we be literally checking like to see the chest rise and fall rise and fall literally like every time oh so do they have to be woken that's a really good question because okay let me just tell you all this in the hospital with my first they literally forced my baby to wake up to breastfeed right but that's not necessary like i don't know it was just the nurse i guess i don't know what their deal was but um that really is not necessary to wake your baby nope because they're actually going to be hungry every two hours so you're not gonna have to wake them they're gonna be waking you so um you don't have to worry about like actually timing it out and they actually say it's t every two to three hours uh, so you don't have to worry about actually timing it out these babies are gonna let you know and then hunger cues is something that you might want to look into when it comes to breastfeeding um, yeah so hunger cues is basically like them getting a little fussy maybe nibbling on their uh, hands um, turning their head to the side especially if you're holding them in this position they'll turn their head to, towards the boob and yeah babies are not wired to overfeed themselves that's what i love about breastfeeding too they're only going to eat when they're hungry and they're not going to overfeed themselves basically yeah so if they're sleeping they're full so you might just have a different schedule this is all depending on baby's age too because we're kind of going over that first month usually within the first month it's every two to three hours for sure like their metabolism is very high breast milk is burn through you know quickly it gives them everything that they need for their immune system and they they restart that cycle of wanting more milk so it depends on how old baby is too but if they're sleeping that's a great sign they're full <laughs> they're not gonna sleep hungry i will tell you that for sure they're not gonna sleep hungry at all so you don't have to worry about waking them um and also what i mentioned about me being in the hospital and them like kind of forcing my son to wake up Keeping the cord attached to your baby is actually nourishing for them enough to stay full with, within that first day, I would say. Like, they're pretty full within that first day from the nourishment they were getting from the placenta. They're not as hungry. They're more so tired from the experience of being birthed. So, even that time, you don't have to worry about babies starving themselves. They're not going to do it, trust me. They're just, they're just not going to do it. They're just not going to do it. Like, they're not going to do it. But yeah, so, um, does breastfeeding hurt? That's a good question too. Um, I want to say with the proper latch, so the latch is very important. Yes, my love. So, so, Jesus is done his Okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you for telling me. She said her brothers don't want his food. Um, okay, so the latch is very important when it comes to like how comfortable mom and baby are. It can hurt if the baby does not have the proper latch. It can hurt if the nipples have gotten so dry that now they are cracking and kind of crusted and all of those things that we don't want to happen. So what I suggest is that before and after every single feeding, try to express a little bit of milk, like just with your hand and rub it right on your nipple. Like I used to use lanolin as a nipple ointment and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with using lanolin. I would still probably suggest it, I think, if you have to. Like, if you feel like your own breast milk is not working for you, then, okay, use lanolin. But breast milk offers that soothing sensation. It has plenty of antibodies that are soothing. And the other reason why I switched to just only adding breast milk to your nipples is because uh, you have to think whatever you put on your nipples is what your baby's going to digest. So all of these fancy creams and stuff, I actually need to take this video off my YouTube where I was making like this little shea butter mixture of nipple cream and it's cute, it's nice, but your baby's gonna have to digest that. Unless you're only using it, what, after feedings and then wiping it off before, but then it's like, I don't know, who's doing all that? Who's doing all that? So why do doctors cut the cord so early? If the baby is still in the process of getting its nutrients girl that's a whole nother conversation because don't even get me started on this rant okay so why do they cut it so early because they're ready to go take a nap they've been in labor with you for however long checking on you and however many other hello 
Am I still here? I don't know why they faking like my service bad. That's one thing I'm like getting a little bit annoyed with Instagram. Don't be mad because I'm telling the truth. <laughs> but yeah, so okay, the money thing, I would say, I want to say no comment on that because most doctors are very ignorant to the actual research that's done behind the scenes. Most doctors, like your your typical regular daily OBGYN, they're kind of ignorant to what the research is going on behind the scenes. So I'm going to say that it's the training. They're trained to cut the cord within a certain time. And I've even heard some doctors say, oh, risk of infection, risk of this, risk of that. Like, they're actually trained these ways. It's not that they're like intentionally out to get you. I always emphasize this in all of my childbirthing classes. It's not that they're intentionally out to get you. They're just poorly trained, like severely poor in the training department. They're not up to date on new information and research because they work so much. They literally work 12 hour shifts or maybe more. So when do you have time to actually sit down and listen, listen to an evidence based birth podcast and be like, oh, delayed cord clamping is good for these babies. So I don't even like get too personal with it like it's their fault it's just the training is poor that's why i especially want moms to start working more so with midwives versus OBGYNs because the training is just different it's different like midwives are literally trained to wait till your cord stops pulsating so yes they're receiving nutrients but also while your baby was in the canal their blood volume is in a constant flow back and forth, right? But while they're squeezing through this 10, centim 10 centimeter spot, right? Some of that blood is pushed back to the placenta. So now 40 to 60% of my baby's blood or maybe even more is still in the placenta. This is why our babies drop the, their birth weight when they're first born. They're anemic because they lost so much blood with just you cutting the cord. So after the baby's born, the placenta is born and then the blood continues to rush to the baby like it's literally uh i can't remember the exact medical term for it but there's literally like a shut that's that's cut off so no more blood will go back to the placenta and it will all go to the baby and then after that the cord turns completely white it stops pulsating like a heartbeat pulsating and then it's time if you want to cut the cord but don't ever let a doctor tell you like oh it's a risk for blah 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 look Look up Lotus birth at your doctor appointment and then ask them like, oh, so where's like, where's the harm that's being done? Because a Lotus birth is when you keep the cord attached and it'll just fall off on its own in the matter of like two to maybe seven days. It'll just fall off on its own. No scissors are required. So I've had this one uh, doctor tell me that they needed to cut the cord in order for the placenta to detach from the uterus wall so like your uterus is like this upside down little hot air balloon looking thing right and then the placenta is attached to a wall of the uterus and after you have your baby oxytocin is immediately happening because you're so happy that you just had a baby and what does oxytocin do for us it causes our uterus to contract also i always try to get my moms to breastfeed before they even um get to that point especially if they're in a hospital bed and they can do so if the cord reaches to the mom and the baby can get on a boob breastfeeding will also stimulate that uterine uh contractions and that's what causes your placenta to detach from that wall not you cutting the cord that does nothing you're just in a rush to get out of the room like i wish they would just just keep it real but okay hopefully that answered your question um so yeah back to the mood swinging right so there's a lot of different feelings that you're gonna feel you're going to basically be on an emotional roller coaster because not because of you, not because of anything that you've done wrong, not because of your baby. It could be because of your birthing experience. Like there's something called postpartum PTSD, which is what post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so depending on how your birth experience went, that could play a part in your mood swings. But more, more so it's hormones. It's literally natural hormones that you're going to experience that are going to kind of cause you to have a high, really happy, then a low, not really feeling like doing anything. Then you're going to be back on high because you're in love with your baby and you're breastfeeding and breastfeeding produces that oxytocin 
that we need as a, a mood booster and then you're gonna be back on a low because you haven't really taken a nap taking a nap today and you're trying to do everything around the house like as if you didn't just have a baby so a lot of those play a part i feel like mom should have a journal that's literally just for your postpartum period and postpartum means i wanted to get into this too postpartum the definition of it is after childbirth so there's no end to when postpartum ends but how you treat yourself in those first couple of months of postpartum will literally set the tone for the rest of the postpartum so if you have a journal for let's see these first three to maybe six months right where every time you you feel something that you can't really explain and you can't really rationalize don't try to don't try to and sometimes it's even smart to not talk to other people that might be insensitive about it because they'll just make you feel worse what i've come to find out is that males don't really understand us they don't really understand us it's not their fault they just never been a woman before they've never had to deal with an influx of hormones that's literally going crazy that you cannot control They've never had to deal with that. So get a journal, you know, lay it out for your journal and don't try to rationalize it. Just understand that it's going to happen. That's the first thing, being aware that it's going to happen. And then two, knowing how and when to release it. So there's a couple of different things. I want to get into the solutions, but I guess I could just, I don't have to go in order. I, there's a couple of different things that I would suggest for releasing it. So journaling um soothing music really really helps raise our vibrations there's a 528 hertz frequency that's literally um nicknamed the love frequency because it helps us produce oxytocin sometimes setting the mood for yourself can be such a huge game changer and what do i mean by setting the mood whatever that is for you lighting a candle grabbing some some snacks preferably like some fruit um something that's not too heavy on you that's also gonna boost your not immune system why was i just say immune system it does boost your immune system but i was gonna say boost your mood um lighting the candle essential oils doing your high breaths if you ever take in my child birthing class you know exactly what the high breaths are and also listening to different frequencies of music like when i was pregnant with jaylani cardi b was it for me <laughs> Cardi B was it for me. But what I realized is that, man, like, like I don't know. I, don't, I can't credit all of my um, anger, spasm things to Cardi B. I can't do that. Because I noticed once Jelani came out, it was like, <sighs> like a deep breath. Like, I really feel like having too much estrogen, whether you're having a boy or girl, right? So if you're having a girl, you have a higher dose of estrogen than you normally would. And if you're having a boy, you have a higher dose of testosterone than you normally would. So that kind of also plays a part in how we feel during pregnancy. But then postpartum, these are your hormones trying to go back and to align with your monthly cycle, basically, of estrogen and progesterone and just kind of soothing itself out. But that takes some time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in six weeks. It's not going to happen in six weeks. Don't let nobody tell you six weeks you're ready to go. You're not ready to go. You're not ready to go. Okay. Get that out the way. But what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Yoga is another thing that I would suggest as far as release. Now, yoga, I want to put a disclaimer on this because it also depends on how postpartum you are. Meaning, like, are you six weeks? Are you four weeks? Are you one week? Are you one day? Like, do things that suit what you can do. If it's not the full-blown yoga exercise where they're doing the uh, the cat cow, the downward facing dog, and I don't know all the positions, but um, if you cannot do all of that, stretching, just normal, regular, sitting on the floor. You know how we used to be in gym class and you got one leg straight and the other leg bent and you just kind of leaning towards it. Don't overdo it. Stretching itself is getting these our body to move in different directions and releasing some of the tension in some areas. So that's going to help boost your immune system too. Um, and then, okay, so the next thing I was going to say is be prepared for less attention during your postpartum than you got during your pregnancy. No, James, no. Thank you for making me that nice picture, asking me to make him more food, not doing it. Hey, Sis Ebony. Hey, girl. 
Um, okay, so yes, yeah, Sis Ebony, feel free to chime in too, girl. We got another doula in the room. Any other doulas, feel free to chime in. We're talking about postpartum, what to expect right now, right? So, what did I just say? Oh, less attention. Be prepared. All of those people that wanted to plan your baby shower and plan your gender reveal and they wanted to rub your belly and be at your house stalking you and how's the baby? How was your doctor's appointment? All those people are going to literally disappear. And if they don't disappear, all their attention is going to be geared towards your baby and not looking at the mom at all. So that's why as a doula, okay, so right now I don't really offer postpartum support, but with my normal package of of my doula support it comes with three postpartum visits those are strictly for the mom i already know you got people stalking your baby i want to know how is mom doing how are you doing like what can we do this visit that's going to make you feel like the attention's on you sis because i know that you're breastfeeding every two hours around the clock i know that every time your baby cries somebody whoever was stalking your baby is going to bring that baby back to you because they know oh your baby want the boo and they can't do nothing about it. I know that. So I use those three visits to really just, what's mom doing? How's work? Like, how has it been since you've been back to work? How are your boobs feeling? Like, little things like that, like, that people never ask you. They always want to know, how's the baby doing? Oh, my God. What size diaper do they wear? What size clothes do they wear? Oh, like, you know... How they, how they smell so good, all that stuff. Okay, yeah, we're great. We know that. We know that. But how is mom doing? How has her cramps been doing? That's the other thing we're going to get into, too. Cramping. Are oh, you finally eating your food? Yes, sir. You want to say hi? Say hi, Samalika. Hi, Samalika. You cute, girl. Okay, goodbye. Um, That's the other thing we're going to get into next, too. There's some cramping because your uterus literally went from, like, I don't know, like this big to fit a whole baby. So <laughs> you literally went from a little pear shape to like a uterus that's so big. And now it's like going back to size. This is completely normal to cramp. Um, they say that the more babies you have, the more severe the cramping is. So like second baby, it might be a little more intense. I definitely uh, experienced this myself. This is not the same for all moms. But with my son, I think I'll, I honestly, hold on. I think honestly, I was on drugs too with my son. <laughs> I think that, look, he looking like, what? <laughs> but no, I had my son in the hospital, right? I had an epidural. Right after birth, they prescribed you ibuprofen. So I don't think I felt cramps, maybe for that reason. But a lot of my moms, like, I don't do any type of pain pills at all now, like, at all. So. Um, even like for my monthly cycle, I just don't take drugs at all. So um, for my son, I feel like it was the ibuprofen. I was like constantly on a schedule of taking ibuprofen. So maybe that's why I didn't feel them. But I do remember that with Jaylani, it was different. Like every single suck she was sucking while breastfeeding, I could feel my uterus getting smaller. And it was like little baby contractions every single time. So Octavia, I saw like, um look james thirsty i don't know if you heard him in the background but um yeah so your uterus is going to contract especially while breastfeeding because the oxytocin that's being produced while you're breastfeeding the sucking is literally going to shrink your baby i mean not your baby your uterus back to size to regular size so be ready to experience some cramping now what i would suggest for the solutions for the cramping is a heating pad um also look at jelani cleaning up i'm just so proud right now i told them before i started the live i was like okay once y'all done eating clean the living room she's cleaning look how my living room looks i'm just so happy okay so a heating pad hot teas i almost made myself some tea for this too because there's something called um a postpartum tea oh you have a one-year-old oh that's what's up girl i'm glad to hear that congratulations too on your one one year anniversary of pushing a baby out that's a lot of work and carrying a baby and all of the above so but a heating pad also what i've come to find too more recently is something called a right a hot rice sock where you basically put like uncooked rice in a sock you could fill it up uh you know as much as you want and then like it's flexible it moves right so you can heat this up <sighs> 
I know that people heat it up in a microwave, but I want to actually get back to y'all on that because I'm also against microwaves too. So if there's a better way to heat that rice up in the sock, like maybe like heating up your stove and just setting it on top of the stove, I'll try out some things and then I'll come back and let y'all know because I don't know. But basically they heat up the rice in the sock, which I guess it's not that different. Put it in the microwave versus um, the electric heating pads because it's still radiation and you're not ingesting it. So I don't know. But anyway, that's another one, another technique um, to put on your belly and your lower back wherever you're feeling the cramps like don't just don't push through the pain the other thing is hot teas so warm fluids help warm foods in general like any doula will tell you during postpartum you want to be as warm as possible you want to be keeping your feet covered keeping your head covered uh clothed fully clothed you want to stay as warm as possible because what does warmth do if you notice during a, a fever when your child has like a virus that they might have came in contact with and they have a fever. Mommy, yes. It's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so clean. Thank you so much. So you, so I just found my food. Good job. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you notice when you're not feeling well, you have a fever, right? What is that doing for your body? It's creating an environment where viruses can't thrive. That's why I'm against like the Tylenol for fevers because you're taking away the fever and now the virus can just roam freely and do whatever it wants to whatever body system it can reach so yes ma'am so keeping yourself warm plays a part in keeping out any type of sickness because you got to remember you just went from 10 centimeters it's not shrinking back down and your womb is not being closed up in one day in a couple hours it's not happening that fast so you're still very open, which is why I also don't suggest that moms take baths early postpartum. You're still too open. You don't need to be sitting in a, a, a pool of, you know, some possibly bacterial dirty water. You just don't. We don't want viruses to get in during this time because that postpartum is very, very crucial. Okay. As far as your health. So stay warm, warm fluids, soup broths um all of the warm foods all of the warm foods okay and drinks so that is solutions for cramping then let's get into like the little we kind of went over some of the mood swings too but a lot of people think like oh i have postpartum and that's just you know that's just what i got there's literally uh levels to this so sometimes moms will start off within that first couple of days after or the first week after and they'll have baby blues something called baby blues baby blues is very early on but it can lead to postpartum depression it's not the same as postpartum depression baby blues is literally mood swings kind of being irritable like you don't want too much company like i ain't in the mood all of those things a lot of these play in a part uh a lot of these things that we go through postpartum nutrition is a huge factor nutrition we might be low on magnesium um b vitamins things like that uh we're not getting whole nutritious meals especially with breastfeeding they're literally taking the nutrition from you it's the same as when you're pregnant the baby don't care if you eating the right meals they're gonna find the nutrients from somewhere in your body which is why we always have a lot of teeth problems or cavities popping up while we're uh pregnant or whatever the, the case may be after the fact too because they're going to take those nutritions from wherever they can get it from. So if you're not replacing those, you're going to be in some trouble. Um, there's anxiety where if you feel like any of these things, this just takes me back to the journal. Go back to your journal. Write them out. If you have somebody that you can trust, like preferably a doula, um, somebody that's going to automatically understand, or your midwife. That's another thing. It does not matter how postpartum you are. You can do regular checkups with your midwife every year you should be doing annual checkups with your midwife how are you doing you can talk to them about all of these things that just seem crazy to you and then they'll be able to be like no this is normal because this is why it's happening literally and then that makes you feel better because you're not just looking at yourself like what is wrong with me okay because usually that's never the case okay so a couple of things I just want to mention because I feel like this is going to be a little bit too long. I have my postpartum planning guide right here in front of me. Let me just show you. It's kind of cute. I tried to make it myself. Well, I did make it myself. So this is the postpartum planning guide. 
a couple of things i always go to this uh when it comes to planning your postpartum there's thing everything that you want to know is within this same postpartum planning guide and it's completely free too so it's in the it's already in the link in my bio easy to grab um and it has literally everything so one of the things i want to go over in this live is the this is what i would consider the planning part right what do i need to plan you need to plan out your laundry who's going grocery shopping um who's doing the cooking how many meals do we have prepped beforehand um child care activities if you have like another child in the house uh like as far as like picking them up from school or whatever activities you might already have them assigned in who's going to be doing all these pickups because please like do not think that you're going to be ready to just dive back into grocery shopping like i know we be doing it i know we be doing it because i bear witness i did it with my daughter i was at the grocery store like three days later and but that's also because i have a problem with asking for help I have a problem with asking for help. And then also on top of that, I didn't really have nobody to ask anyway. So I, I had a problem with speaking up. I wanted to be super woman, super mom and all those things. And literally when I say my hair, I was bald. I was bald all in this area. Like my hair got so thin. I started shedding so much. My bleeding would like never stop. These are all signs that you're doing too much. The shedding. The constant bleeding past your six weeks or if it stopped and then it started again somewhere you're doing too much your cramping hasn't stopped you're doing too much headaches you're doing too much you're not getting enough rest these are all signs that lead to we need to delegate we need to start delegating some of your daily things that you need done and let somebody else do them I know we're not all comfortable with having somebody watch our baby like i'm nowhere near comfortable with that but are you comfortable with having them do your laundry are you comfortable with having them pick up some things so you don't have to pay ample amount of money with instacart you know grocery shopping are you comfortable with them maybe even watching the baby just long enough for you to take a shower long enough for you to take a nap long enough for you to get your nails done like maybe bring them to the nail shop with you when it's time for you to get out of the house like we have to just decide what we're comfortable with and then delegate those things because if you're gonna plan to do all of these things and not delegate anything like we're gonna be in some, some trouble so another thing i want to kind of go over this little pamphlet i got from a class that i took and it was a couple things that i really really that really stood out to me so one of the things as far as the first month postpartum right it says make time in your busy life to concentrate on getting to know your baby and to rest. I love the getting to know your baby part because that's going to help you later in the future when it's time to actually make a schedule or go back to work. Getting to know your baby schedule first is going to help you because a lot of moms, we do this backwards and we try to force our babies on one, uh, one schedule or how we see it fit for our lives. But the forcing part of things is where the stress comes into play for me i prefer a stress free, a stress-free life <laughs> whether i am postpartum pregnant or whatever like i prefer a stress-free life so i don't mind seeing what works best for my baby and then scheduling around that so getting to know your baby is very very important in the beginning right their sleep schedule their eating schedule all of those things when they want to stay up and play for a little bit when they're just so tired Things like that. We can all plan around these things if we just take the time to get to know our babies first and then worry about a schedule later. Um, okay, so meal prepping, we kind of went over that. Uh, housework, laundry, that kind of plays into that part. Um, we want to delegate those things. You cannot be carrying a big laundry bag to the laundromat like I be having to do. If you have laundry in the house, then okay, as much as you can carry, but you're not supposed to carry anything that's heavier than your baby during that time so that's like what about eight pounds maybe even seven so if you got a big laundry basket you need to take some of those clothes out even maybe scoot it whatever like we're not supposed to be picking up anything that's heavier than our baby um be very flexible as far as planning things with friends family all of those things just be ready to be very very flexible um okay so managing your sleep schedule 
we kind of went over this in the beginning but definitely you want to be focused on napping you're not gonna get a full night's rest uh within those first i don't know with breastfed babies i want to say the first six months for sure until you can actually sleep and eat i mean let them eat at the same time but especially during those first three months where you actually have to sit up and birth them, birth them after every feeding you want to get naps during the daytime you cannot skip naps during the daytime i don't care what time it is um or how somebody else is looking at you thinking you're lazy and all of this like journal it burn it whatever you got to do to release that uh feeling but don't let other people's feelings towards you dictate how you move as a mom like just don't 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 um yeah so that's one of the things i definitely wanted to hit on those naps so i think that's about it for me today um just so you guys know i do go live every tuesday so if you do have any thoughts on what you need to hear next please feel free to dm me i'm always down for a dm conversation and let me know what do i need to come on here and talk about but i feel like postpartum is very important because a lot of us are go into it so unprepared so let's start planning our postpartum and yeah that's it i'll see y'all next tuesday